I want to talk a little bit about hospital discharge and about the program that we have in our county to uh, help people transition from inpatient hospitalization to other settings, home to homeless people. But I thought I'd start it by showing you just 60 seconds of the video. Got this on YouTube. There are many, sadly, many similar kinds of videos like this that you can find. Um, and this is just a piece of um, Caroline's story. In March of 2006, a 63-year-old woman named Caroline Reyes, wearing a hospital gown and diaper, was found wandering the streets of Skid Row. Hospital dumping is a phenomenon that should break the heart of everybody who has She had been literally dumped there after being discharged from a local hospital. Thinking individuals who are homeless, potentially homeless, who are not their permission, their consent, driving them to Skibula, which is without a doubt one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in all of the United States, and leaving them there. She was discharged from the hospital with no shoes, no medication, and no instructions for her medical care. What the state law requires is that hospitals make appropriate arrangements as part of the discharge planning, which take into account the special needs of the individual patients involved. Caroline Reyes has, on many occasions, raised her fist and looked me in the eye and said, somebody has to say something. And it's for us to be her voice. That is what public counsel is doing for us. We are speaking for them. So the, the video goes on to talk about the public council program, which is in LA, um, and has been doing tremendous work in um, accessing more appropriate um, care and services for people who um, are leaving the hospital. So th this was at Los Angeles, and I mean that video, when you see the numbers of people on, in, on Skid Row, I've, I've been down there, I've been down there at night. It was scary, as they say, um, and, and breathtaking. We certainly don't have that kind of homelessness in Montgomery County or in the metro DC area at all. But we're not immune from the problem of homelessness and we're not Im immune from the problem of inappropriate hospital discharge. Um, until 2010, our five wonderful hospitals, and they truly are wonderful hospitals we have in the county, um, each year would identify as they were discharging patients perhaps 20 or 30 people among the thousands of people they were serving each year as being homeless and discharging them to the shelter through some sort of a, a, a war panda. But every year there were hundreds of homeless people who were being discharged from the hospital and nobody either knew they were homeless or nobody really did a whole lot about it in terms of thinking about the kinds of things that were mentioned in the video about making sure that a person who has been homeless and is coming out of the hospital has a safe place to go, has the necessary um, the ability to fill any prescriptions that might be handed to them in the hospital, that linkage has been made with their primary care providers or other providers in the community that have seen them in the past, um, that they have appropriate clothes. People come into the emergency room, it's an emergency situation, they cut off their clothes or they take off their clothes, and especially with homeless people, their clothes aren't things that they want to really kind of store for them, they're gone, and then it's time to discharge them. And you saw it, um, Carol Ann walking down the street in her hospital bed. So, so what was happening before we started our program I told you some already uh, people were, were discharged to the family or to, to friends where are you going to go tonight, ma'am? Oh, I, I'm going to go to my friend's house. There really wasn't any friend. These people were homeless and in many cases were known to be homeless, but were the, the hospital staff thought, well, you know what, they'll take care of it. It'll be okay. So people were also being discharged to the shelter. And Sharon London, my wonderful friend here, who used to oversee the, what we call the shorthand the men's emergency shelter in Montgomery County, um, would the, there would be people that would be dropped off in a cab and they were just there and nobody called ahead of time and said, so Sharon, we're going to send this person over and they just had surgery and they probably need to be staying in the bed during the day tomorrow and by the way, they need this, that, and the other thing. No, they just were, were sent um, to the shelter, if in fact they even got to the shelter, with no prior arrangements made. 
Um, they didn't have clothes, as I said before. They didn't have the prescriptions or, or way to fill prescriptions. And there was no way to connect them up with, with their primary care providers um, for ongoing care. So what um, county staff created, and I must say it was primarily Ellen Brown and a couple of people who were working with her at the time, was, was a program which we, after the fact, realized was, was something that we could kind of package into something what we call now safe transitions. But it was a comprehensive set of a couple of things. Number one, training and tools for the, to help the hospitals know how to identify the people's housing status as they were coming into the inpatient setting, and then particularly before they, they were ready for discharge. Um, and then to help the hospitals also develop that appropriate discharge plans to meet their needs so that they wouldn't end up back in the hospital. Um, our, we have on our staff two full-time nurses who uh, work with the hospital discharge planners and the case managers on, on preparing the discharge plan, determining whether, number one, it's even appropriate for the person to be discharged, or whether they really are ready to be discharged, and um, which is, you know, one thing, if they're discharging me and I've got this wonderful husband at home who will take care of me. But if you're discharging somebody even to a very wonderful shelter like the men's emergency shelter, if they don't have the proper supports in place, maybe it's not time yet for them to be discharged. And then um, determining whether a shelter is even the appropriate place for them, whether they might need to be in a nursing home because they need rehab services, or again, like I said, whether they're even ready, or whether there might be options like friends and family who might be available and able to, to provide uh, ongoing housing and support. And then also making arrangements for the, the ongoing medical care, the prescriptions, transfer of medical records, and in some instances even for basic things like, like clothing and diapers. So what's really made that, the program a success are three things that I felt I could put down on paper and then one thing that I said I, could, I thought I couldn't put down on paper. So the three things I did put down is the relationship building with the hospitals. I mean, that's key. The relationship between uh, the ladies on my staff and the hospital discharging, discharge planning and clinical staff. And then the relationship, number two, with, with the um, shelters and nursing homes. Um, when we started out, we had a great relationship with several of the shelters, but have now expanded that. And also, um, we had really no nursing home kinds of resources that were willing to see um, even patients with Medicaid to say nothing of people who are totally uninsured. We now have, a, have a, a network of nursing homes that are willing to take some of these patients. Um, relationship building between our staff and primary care providers in the community that are serving um, homeless people, if, again, so that we can have that, that more appropriate transition. Um, that I said, repeat as necessary. We've done a lot of training, we've distributed a lot of materials, and we have to do it again and again and again. Number one, staff, turn over. And also, people get busy, people get distracted by other things, caseloads start growing, and then we start then we start getting the calls from the shelter saying, you didn't tell me so-and-so was going to come over to me from the hospital. Well, we didn't know he was coming either. So then we have to repeat as necessary. So the one piece that I didn't put down on paper is really about, about the hospitals. And, and what's also making this program a success is really kind of juicing the hospitals a little bit. Giving them, you know, pushing them, pushing them to say, you know, no, you cannot discharge this patient. This person is not ready. Working with the providers to say, well, Dr. So-and-so, you really need to reevaluate whether or not really this person is ready for discharge. Are you aware that this person is homeless? Are you aware that you're discharging them to a shelter um, as best case? Um, do you really think that this person can be medically stable in that environment? Um, putting the pressure really on the hospitals. We're saving them money in the long term, helping them understand that, that we're reducing readmission. We're, we're reducing, some, in some cases, some, some very negative consequences, and in some cases, some very negative PR for them. We don't want homeless people dying anywhere. We certainly don't want them dying on the street or in Sharon's shelter. Yes, sir, just about done. So here are our results. As I said, when we started this program, a couple dozen people that were identified by the hospitals where there were arrangements made between the hospital and the shelters to discharge 20, 30 people a, a year. Now we're up to 200 people a year. We, we are discharging, you can see the five hospitals. We're discharging, we're working with discharges from the five hospitals to great success. Um, we um, are working with other organizations and other agencies that are discharging people like the state psychiatric facility, criminal justice facilities, um, and as you, that, that last line before the total, you can see that the word is getting out that we have um, a resource that we can really help, again, ultimately helping our clients, but helping the organizations dealing with their clients. And most importantly, not one individual was discharged from the hospital to the street in the last three years. So that's, wow. 
So here's our contact information. I, I know Bonnie, if you're distributing, um, distributing um, the slides and, and all, um, we're doing that, doing this to great success in Montgomery County. I bet you're doing it here. Uh, people are doing this around the country. But we want to learn from you, and we want to help you all who, who are working in this area. If you are interested in learning more about what we're doing and, and uh, taking a look at, at our tools, um, I just want a, a brief little small commercial. We submitted this program to the National Association for Counties. They have an annual recognition of outstanding county programs, and uh, we're being recognized this year as one of several hundred outstanding uh, county programs. We're also being recognized among those several hundred as the best healthcare innovation. Um, among the several hundred that they're recognizing. And again, um, much credit to my colleague, Ellen Brown, for doing that. So thank you. Thank you, Jean. Uh, sounds like an impressive program. Uh, our next speaker, uh, Colin Burke, uh, who is a third year medical student at the uh, Albert Medical School at Brown University. Right. Um, thank you so much for having me. It's really nice to be here. This has been a really incredible uh, day so far. Very educational. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, so my name is Colin Burke. I'm a third year uh, med student at Brown. Um, it's really nice to get a day out of pediatrics clinic as well today. Um, <laughs> had enough uh, trying to give flu shots to screaming children for one week, I think. Um, so I'm going to try to keep things kind of, um, I'm kind of trying to kind of cut to the chase. Um, presenting a research study, I'm feeling a little heat from the statistics before. Um, you guys let me know if you see anything in the numbers you don't think. Um, that was very uh, impressive. Um, so, uh, so this study came out of the Providence VA, actually. Um, and my, my research mentor is Dr. Tom O'Toole, um, who started the, uh, the Providence Homeless Oriented Primary Care Clinic, which is where this data was collected. Um, so the, the title of the study is Losing Work, Regional Unemployment, and Its Effect on Homeless uh, Demographic Characteristics, Needs, and Healthcare. Um, so just as a little bit of background, um, and it kind of fits in nicely with some of the discussion from earlier today, actually. Uh, so there's a fairly well-established literature on causes of homelessness at the individual level, so things like uh, substance abuse, mental health conditions, uh, family crises, loss of social supports. What's surprisingly less well-defined is sort of the impact that larger regional uh, economic trends have on the makeup and the needs of homeless populations. Um, so our research question for this study, the primary question was, uh, what effect does increasing regional unemployment have on the demographics, reasons for homelessness, and healthcare and social service needs of homeless veterans? And then as an extension of that, uh, what implications do these trends have on prioritization of public funding uh, during times of economic downturn, as we all know, uh, it's an incredibly <coughs> scarce resource and, and a limited sort of pot of funding. Um, so how can we better prioritize, or how can we sort of start thinking about prioritizing these things in the context of an economic downturn? Um, so just a little bit of background on where the data comes from. Um, so again, the, the Providence VA's Homeless Oriented Primary Care Clinic, it's really a comprehensive medical home. Um, provides not only uh, medical primary care, but also mental health referrals and some comprehensive case management services uh, for homeless veterans in the, in the Providence area. And it continues to expand and continues to sort of build on that, uh, on the support services that it provides. Um, and again, it was started by Dr. Tom O'Toole who really had the foresight to, to be collecting some of this data. Um, and, and with the VA's robust sort of electronic health record system, there's really, it really allows us a, a great opportunity to look at changes in the homeless population over time. Um, so each new patient who comes into the clinic undergoes uh, a pretty comprehensive initial uh, intake assessment. It's, um, it, it's performed by uh, the clinic's nurse manager, um, and it collects a wide range of uh, characteristics, including demographic information, homeless history, including a, a self-reported cause of homelessness, um, medical, mental health, and substance abuse history, social supports, and current needs. Again, all sort of identified by these new patients who are coming into the clinic. Uh, so the population for this study was 400 consecutive homeless veterans who were presenting for an initial visit with this clinic and who were undergoing this in intake assessment. Um, so again, we were trying to look at how um, sort of regional economic trends were influencing the makeup of this population. So we took a look at the, the sort of unemployment rates during this time, and it's a pretty impressive 
curve. I mean, this is really a snapshot, right, uh, during the, the Great Recession. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's a pretty steep rise there. This is our, again, so we start, we, our clinic population is 400 patients um, from January 2007 to June of 2011 for our study population. And in order to take a look at how, you know, these, this population was changing over time, we decided to uh, split the group into two cohorts, one of which had presented during a time of relatively low regional unemployment, one of which had presented during a time of relatively high regional unemployment. So that split point ended up being January of 2009. It roughly bisects that kind of linear increase in the regional unemployment rates. And it broke down to about 200 patients in each group. So uh, I'll back up for a second before I go to results. So uh, essentially what we were doing was, was sort of gathering all of these people's uh, answers to the, to the questions on the intake assessment form. And we were comparing them between these two groups, again, to just take a look at how the economy or how, how rising unemployment had changed the needs and the characteristics of these groups. So to start the results, uh, the things that were not significantly different between the two groups, the so-called pertinent negatives. Um, so there was no major difference in average age, in gender, race, educational level, um, mental health histories, current alcohol use, um, and no major differences in some, uh, some of the uh, self-reported causes of homelessness, uh, including substance abuse, mental health, uh, post-incarceration status and uh, domestic, uh, domestic disputes. Um, perhaps more interestingly than what was different between the two groups. Um, so we saw an increase in the number of individuals reporting unemployment and uh, an inability to afford a previous residence. Um, so in that second group, no longer able to afford previous re residence, that includes people who were evicted, people who were foreclosed on, as well as people who had been stably doubled up in the past and then were no longer able to double up with family. Um, in addition, we saw an increase in people who were first time homeless, uh, which was reflected in a, a decrease in people reporting previous episodes of homelessness. We saw an increase in the number of people reporting a work history in office-based or clerical positions. Uh, an increase, interestingly, in people who were reporting a need for mental health services, as well as people who identified uh, mental health support as one of the things they needed to exit homelessness. And again, this is in the, in the setting of a similar uh, prevalence of mental health diagnoses between the two groups, which is sort of interesting. Um, in addition, an increase in people uh, reporting difficulty accessing care, and an increase in people reporting current drug use. So in addition to looking at the differences between these two groups, we wanted to better characterize who are the people who are reporting economic causes of homelessness, so who are reporting unemployment, and inability to afford their previous residence as a cause of homelessness um, in both cohorts. So what we did was we put together a multiple logistic regression model. Um, so individuals, again, in both cohorts who reported unemployment as a cause of homelessness were significantly more likely to report recent alcohol use, significantly more, less likely to report a mental health diagnosis, more likely to be from the area, but less likely to have family support in the area. Um, and those reporting cost of housing as a cause of homelessness were more likely to report recent drug use uh, and less likely to have recent contact with family. So what are the implications of this? Sort of what is the, what is the picture that this, this presents to us of the change in this population with, with rising unemployment? So again, just to sort of summarize our results, um, we saw an increase in people who were first time homeless, people who were directly affected by the economy, people who reported sort of economic causes of homelessness. Uh, people who had been previously employed in office-based jobs, an increase in people, were, uh, the number of people requesting mental health care, and it seems like there's a trend towards sort of decreased social support, as well as, I should note, an increase in uh, recent substance use. So in terms of sort of bigger picture, how might this inform thinking about prioritizing funding during economic downturns for um, homeless support and homeless, homelessness prevention? Um, so the first thing I, I think this sort of points towards a, a real need for a focus on prevention. Um, again, interestingly, so these are people who are who have been previously employed and are sort of marginally employed, living in this sort of uh, last hired, first fired uh, sort of situation. So uh, this kind of points to a need for education and job retraining in order to sort of solidify the, the standing of these individuals in the workforce to make them less vulnerable to unemployment during times of economic downturn. Um, in addition, one another you know, huge part of homelessness prevention is support for uh, maintaining housing. <clears throat> so for avoiding uh, foreclosures and evictions, um, 
strategies, including bridge funding and kind of helping people stay in the housing that they currently have. Um, in addition, so that we, we did see an increase in the number of people who are first time homeless. So these are people who are less likely to be able to, to have sort of experience navigating social, so, social support systems um, and sort of public support systems. So again, this sort of just points to an increased need for um, a place where these individuals can go to sort of you know, learn what resources are available to them to sort of limit the time that they're homeless. Um, additionally, increased support for maintaining social networks, which is kind of like a fairly abstract thing to think about. Um, but again, as it's been noted multiple times here, you know, usually the first stop along the road is you know, staying with family, staying with friends, sort of exhausting social support systems. The more we can provide these individuals with supports on their way through that, the less of a sort of burden they are, and the more they're able to maintain their valuable social networks. Um, in addition, uh, this points to an increased need for substance abuse and mental health support, especially for those who are newly homeless and for those who have been previously employed but really for everyone. Um, so I, I do want to note multiple limitations for this study because you know, we like to think big picture and we like to sort of uh, give, our, give our thoughts on what we should do based on our data, but it's important to realize what the limitations are. So uh, all of this data does rely on self-reporting from individuals who came to the clinic. Um, it's possible that, that things like substance abuse, mental health, and causes of homelessness were underreported um, or sort of misreported, especially because these are um, reports from people who are having a first-time encounter with a clinic staff member um, who's sort of unknown to them. Um, in addition, it's possible that there's underreporting of destructive personal behaviors leading to job loss. So it's possible that all, you know, for everyone who's reporting unemployment as a cause of homelessness, it's not directly a cause, a result of, um, you know, economic conditions. It could also be a result of, you know, substance abuse and, uh, or sort of absenteeism that's leading to unemployment. Um, in addition, so this was a clinic-based population, um, which biases uh, towards people who have increased sort of self-assessed need as well as increased capacity to access healthcare. Um, additionally, this population is older than the general homeless population. Um, it is, again, pretty uh, remarkably uh, majority Caucasian and majority male as well, uh, which does sort of skew potentially the results and potentially limits generalized ability. Um, so that's sort of our study in a nutshell. Definitely look forward to any questions people have uh, during the discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. Um, and our third speaker is uh, Nicole Truy, who is a, uh, a doctoral student in the uh, School of Public Policy here at Mason. Uh, as well as manager of uh, government relations and public policy at uh, Youth Villages, one of the nation's uh, great uh, examples of social entrepreneurship. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and I'm probably taking a risk uh, being the last presenter, but I have no slides, so you get to stare yeah. at me. <laughs> so hopefully this will be painless. Um, so yes, yeah, so uh, I'm Nicole Truy. I'm uh, from Youth Villages uh, and also a PhD student as mentioned. My research here is actually on the population I'll be speaking about. Not the specific age range I'll be speaking about, but it is about the child welfare system, a system and a population we haven't really um, touched on um, today. And uh, possibly my presentation might, might serve as a PSA um, because this isn't a population that really is focused on a lot and there is a lack of information and um, acknowledgement out there about the real high rates of homelessness and other issues associated particularly with the population I'll be speaking about, which is um, youth aging out of the child welfare system. So just a little bit about um, youth villages. Uh, and the, obviously this presentation is going to be a little unique. It's because we are direct service providers. So I'll be talking directly about a specific program associated with um, uh, with working with the aging out population. So as indicated, I guess we're a nationally known, and in fact we are a nationally known organization. Uh, Youth Villages is 25 years old, based in Memphis, um, Tennessee, uh, about you know, 1,600 plus staff. Uh, we serve about um, 4,000 youth on any given day, about 18 to 20,000 um, over a year's time. We are a um, full-term continuum of care, mental and social services organization, so that means we serve kids from birth, essentially, to 22, 23 years of age, and 
in every type of service um, you could po probably think of if you're familiar with the child welfare system, residential care, foster care, adoption services, um, et cetera, but what we're mainly known for is in-home work. So working with uh, a child who's under the age of 18 in the home environment uh, with their family or other um, entity to keep them from going into child welfare, juvenile justice, or the mental health systems. Um, but we also work with the 17 to 22 year old population, which is the population I'm going to focus on. Those are those kids who are either in the system right now or just about to age out. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about specific data points, unfortunately what happens with those youth, and typically it's at 18 because for a variety of reasons that I won't go into, we as a country decided a long time ago that 18 was this magic number where you're ready to be an adult. And so when kids age out of juvenile justice or child welfare in particular, they're typically, it's not exaggeration, handed a hefty bag of their belongings, whatever they might have, and said, you know, um, good luck. We don't have a real good structure uh, in place in this country to help ease that transition. Uh, and I'm a little far away from having, having been 18. I know, in fact, that I wasn't ready to be uh, on my own at 18, let alone 22, let alone 25, or, you know, over 30 now, and I don't even know if I'm ready to, to do it on my own. Uh, typically, I have my parents to lean on. So, unfortunately, that population is not given um, the, that benefit. So, uh, so we as an organization, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about the, the program we have, but we started focusing on it a lot in the, the late 90s for a variety of reasons that I'll get into. But just a couple of facts, or actually a lot of facts about this population to sort of set the, set the stage for the main point um, of my presentation. Um, one report has indicated that this population, the 17 to 22 year old population, is the most statistically vulnerable population um, of, in our country in terms of sort of the lack of resources available and sort of the high level of negative indicators and consequences associated with them. Um, about 25,000 or so youth age out of our child welfare system every year. Uh, unfortunately, that number has stayed fairly constant over uh, the years. We have about 400 or so thousand kids in foster care in this country right now. Um, that, actually, that number has actually been de excuse me, decreasing over the years, whereas the aging out population has stayed relatively flat. In fact, it ticked up a little bit last year. So there is this disconnect between sort of our, in our ability to keep kids from going into foster care, but once they're in there, they're typically staying, and then they're aging out um, of the system. Um, compared to youth uh, of the same age who are not in the child welfare system, these young adults tend to have uh, lower levels of educational attainment. They typically only achieve a high school diploma or a GED, um, sometimes not even that. Um, obviously, they have, as a result, potentially of that lack of educational attainment, lower employment rates um, overall. And when they do get employed, they have less earnings um, overall. And they tend to experience, again, as a result, poverty and housing instability um, because of a variety of, of those factors. Um, they also have the added benefit um, of having increased mental health problems, substance abusing problems, um, criminal justice involvement, and homelessness. Um, and there's obviously um, causation and correlation between um, those elements, not to mention the fact that a lot of the, the youth are traumatized when they go into the system and then are re-traumatized when they're in the system. So they might have entered child welfare because of mental health issues, but they're also then being, it's being exacerbated by the um, the activity or lack thereof uh, when they're in um, in the system. And they're also more likely to be parenting as teens, um, have own, their own kids that then cycle in uh, and out of the system. There's not been uh, a ton of focus on this population. Um, there is one major study, which is what I'm going to focus on primarily uh, to sort of frame the sort of the real data points around this population out of the University of Chicago, Chapin Hall. Um, Mark Courtney and his group are doing what's called the Mid Midwest Evaluation of Adult Functioning um, of Foster Youth. Um, and their, uh, their project started about five, six years ago. They took a cohort of um, young adults, 17 and 18, in Wisconsin, Illinois, and, and Iowa, about 700 or so in the first cohort, co cohort excuse me, and they followed them for five, six years now, um, interviewing them every year, every um, year and a half. 
on a, on a variety of metrics, including their living arrangements, their educational attainment, uh, their general economic well-being, access to government services, um, et cetera. And they've used that data in comparison to a nationally um, representative sample of uh, you know, like-aged individuals um, from the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health to sort of do a comparison as to sort of where these young adults are on various metrics in comparison to sort of a, a typical child who isn't cycling in or hasn't had interaction with the child welfare system. So just some interact interesting um, facts that relate to the themes of this, uh, this conference. In terms of living arrangements, the youth in this study and the data points I'm quoting are from the last wave. So these kids now are 26 years old. They've been technically out of the system for six plus years. Uh, and it's the last round of data collection they're doing. So in terms of living arrangements, just under a third um, of these young adults um, describe themselves as living in their own place. So only about 33% are living either by themselves or in a place that they own. They're not living with a family, they're not living with a, a relative or a friend or an, or an other type of congregate, congregate setting. Only about 1% had indicated being homeless at any point in time, but that's in comparison to the comparison group that said that, and none of them said at that point in time that they had been homeless. Um, but what's even more shocking is that 15% uh, identified being homeless at some point in time um, since the last interview. So within the last year, 15% of them were homeless at some point. That included things like couch surfing, et cetera. We haven't talked a lot, but sometimes the definition of homelessness um, can be a little fuzzy. Uh, and then more than a third reported being homeless um, in a homelessness period that lasted more than a month. So their homelessness is not just one or two, it's a, it's a fairly sustained period of time that they're finding themselves homeless. Uh, in terms of education, they started out with a deficit. As I indicated, they're less likely to attain um, anything above a high school or GED um, level of education. Those def deficits persisted. So they never got better. They never got access or were able to attain a higher level of educational attainment um, than they were when they were uh, interviewed at, at wave one. So they fa stayed fairly stagnant. Um, that's in comparison, obviously, to the comparison group um, where those adults were more than three times as likely to have something other than a high school diploma or GED. Uh, in terms of uh, employment or early earnings, less than 50% of the young adults were uh, employed full-time at time of interview, um, and they were making roughly $20,000 less on average than the comparison group in similar types of um, industries or, or positions. And then finally, on sort of the health, mental health metrics, somebody mentioned earlier in the, in the conference this whole idea of resiliency. A significant percentage of these young adults tend to describe themselves as being in excellent health, good health, on, you know, on a positive path, yet they're twice as likely to have poor health or other health conditions or disabilities that, are impact, that could impact them negatively in terms of um, edu uh, employment uh, opportunities or might uh, Im negatively impact them um, generally. Um, so overall, uh, what this study has indicated is that this group is, 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 uh, is uh, faring very poorly, that their economic well-being is fairly negative, and overall, it suggests that these young people um, aren't, we're not equipping them with the knowledge uh, and the skills needed to make it on their own that there are some natural deficits either in their personal um, um, makeup, in their natural environments, uh, and in the systems in which we've placed them in that are not allowing them to achieve on a variety of metrics. Uh, and so what we have now, unfortunately, is a very high rate, as indicated, of homelessness in this population, um, of mental health and substance abusing issues, uh, of, of teen pregnancy, et cetera, et cetera, in this population. So, um, and this data is new data. Um, there was anecdotal data, obviously, which I mentioned earlier, going on about what is that exactly happening in this population. But now we have some hard data. But in, in 1999, Youth Village has actually started a program focused on this population based primarily on um, the generous philanthropic giving of a private individual in the state of Tennessee, which again speaks to the fact that government funding isn't really out there. There's not a lot of focus on it from sort of the natural, normal resources state and, and state and federal funding. Um, so we have a program that focuses on the 17 to 22 year old population, very intensive, 
one counselor to one adult. They're on call 24-7 to this young adult. They meet with them at least once a week. They only carry a caseload of six to eight young adults, so they have a lot of time to invest in these individuals. They focus on all types of activities, including making sure they have stable housing, um, making sure they have access to the educational um, achievements that they want to have, if that means a GED, if that means going to college, if that means to going to community colleges, etc. <coughs> Helping them with resume building and job finding. Um, balancing a budget, checkbooks, how to open a bank account, very tangible things that unfortunately we don't focus on um, with these individuals when they're in the child welfare system. And of course when they age out, they lack the uh, ability sometimes to do those basic, those basic elements. So our counselors, our, our transitional living spe specialists are working with these young adults typically for about nine months is our length of stay to try to get them to a place where they have a roof over their head, they have a job, or, or they're achieving some sort of educational achievement that will get them into a position where they'll be able to get stable employment. Uh, we're focused on their mental health issues and getting them access, ensuring they have insurance and are accessing the types of services they need, the medications, et cetera. Um, we have been collecting data on all the kids that we serve in this program since we started doing it in 99. We're a very outcome-driven organization. Um, we tra track all the individuals we serve for two years post-discharge. So we have two, year, uh, two years of outcome data for every youth serve. Uh, and what our data shows us is that 84% at two years post-discharge are living successfully. That means they're living independently or with a family member or, or, or a friend, but they're not homeless, they're not in a group setting or a group uh, facility in a residential facility, they're living on their own. 77% um, are crime free, so they haven't had any, any interactions with the juvenile justice system, uh, probation, parole, um, et cetera. 89% have not been pregnant. We started tracking the pregnancy factor um, for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is that we are seeing a number of our young women um, pregnant or having multiple kids. We had one um, young woman who had uh, triplets and twins within like a three year period. Uh, and she herself was only 19, and so she had five kids, um, you know, under the age of two. She herself was you know, not not very stable educationally, employment-wise, et cetera. And then obviously we had to do the same thing with our our our, our male um, our male clients in terms of educating them on how you know certain activities lead to certain negative consequences. Again, because <laughs> when you cycle, when you have kids, it just add, it adds that burden for you being able to achieve, and then your kids up in the system, and the cycle never ends. Uh, and then 79% um, at two years post discharge aren't receiving mental health services, or they're accessing the services that they need at the point in time in which they need them. It's all about self sufficiency and engagement, and empowering them to find the resources, access the resources, and have the knowledge to know um, where to go. But of course, for the statisticians, this isn't you know randomized control trial. This is just us collecting data internal to our organization. So what do we do? We found people to fund a random control trial. So we are now in the midst of a random control trial. Um, we uh, actually MDRC and Mark Courtney is the PI on it, and it's being funded by some very large foundations, Clark and Gates Foundation. We actually just finished the randomization process. We have 1,300 young adults randomized into the study about two-thirds getting our service and a third getting just sort of normal community services. Um, the objective ultimately is to provide reliable evidence to inform the design of policies because as I mentioned there's very few policies and very little funding out there for this population but just as importantly programs and interventions to find out what it is that needs to be done to ameliorate the issues that this population presents itself to us with and then is exacerbated by the lack of uh, interventions that are out there and services that are out there. Um, so we're going to track the young adults for five years, looking at things like um, earnings potential, educational achievement, uh, public assistance, Medicaid, their access to government benefits, involvement with the uh, criminal justice system, um, et cetera. Um, the first report implementation analysis is due out in 2013, and then in 2015 um, will be a more uh, a report focused on the impacts and outcomes. Um, I put outside, so if you're interested for more information on your way out, a one pager on the program, and then the primer that's come out so far. MDRC put a primer out about two, three months ago, um, sort of setting up the setting the stage for um, you know, what the study is going to do and what the need is for focusing on this population. So. Um, so sort of in closing, 
Um, again, a population that's not tended to be focused on, but obviously has, has all the issues we've been discussed today and probably some more given the fact that they are young and lack um, sort of, you know, just life experiences, et cetera. Um, but one where if we don't focus on them, they are the ones that end up in our adult, adult jails. Um, there's a statistic out there, I think it's something like 40 plus percent of, of prisoners have been in the foster care system. Um, so they end up eating up the resources of adult systems. And unfortunately, child welfare system doesn't focus on them, the adult system doesn't want them yet, so they sort of straddle in this sort of no man's land. Uh, and services we hope, like this, will help to uh, address their issues and then obviously lead to um, um, them not churning through the system as they, they currently are. So thank you very much.